UFC on ABC2, also known as UFC Vegas 23, headlined by Marvin Vittori and Kevin Holland. I'm your host, Ben Duffy of SureDog.com. I would normally be accompanied by my co-host Keith Schillen, but real life intervenes, and thus I will be running solo, at least on most of the prelims. SureDog associate editor Jay Petrie is scheduled to join me for at least the main card. Without any further ado, let's dive right into those prelims. The first fight out of the gate is a welterweight attraction between Impa Kasanganai and Sasha Palatnikov. Kasanganai, the 27-year-old North Carolina native, is 8-1 and one in his young mixed martial arts career. He is 1-1 one and one since joining the UFC out of Dana White's Contender Series. Of course, he fought most recently last October and ended up on the wrong end of perhaps the greatest highlight knockout in UFC history, uh, courtesy of Joaquin Buckley. He will be facing Polatnikov, the 32-year-old uh, first UFC fighter ever from Hong Kong, was also the first uh, fighter from Hong Kong ever to win in the UFC as he made his successful debut against Louis Kosi last November at UFC 255. He is 6-2 overall. Uh, despite that successful debut, he is quite the underdog here as Kasanganai is out there around minus 275, minus 280 or so. As the favorite, you can get Platnikov at plus 240 on the comeback. For the record, uh, Keith did send me his picks for tonight. He is picking Kasanganai. I am going against him here. I'm, I'm going to disagree with Keith. It's funny, when we're both on the preview together, it, it seems like we, we laugh at how often we agree on these. But Kasanganai should beat Palatnikov. But I'm curious to see how he comes back from the loss. Uh, how he comes back from... Uh, from not just a loss, but a crushing loss to Buckley. I'm not concerned that, you know, his psyche is broken or, or anything ridiculous like that, but it's just, it's very strange to me that he chose this time to drop to welterweight from middleweight. If you've seen Kasanganai fight, he's got muscles on top of his muscles. I'm curious as to where he's going to find 15 pounds to lose from that frame. And my concern is that the 15 pounds is going to be all water or virtually all water that doesn't spell good news in that it's going to hurt his chin. It will hurt his cardio. It's, yeah, it's, it's worrisome. And on top of that, I, I underestimated Palatnikov coming in. I looked at his uh, relatively, uh, relatively uh, low level of competition coming in, or what I took to be a low level of competition coming in. The only real name opponent he had faced Munir Lazes had beaten him pretty easily, and I was totally wrong. He he beat Kosi and looked impressive in doing so. Uh, Kasanga and I should have a power advantage over Palatnikov, but I was very impressed with Palatnikov's poise in the fight against Kosi and uh, his ability to hang on late in the fight and basically just hang on and get the win even when things were not going that great for him in in the final round i understand why kasanganai is such a big favorite here and certainly he might make me look really silly in about 45 seconds but i'm going to go with the slightly more known quantity here and strange as that sounds to me that's palatnikov at this point i have no reason to believe that palatnikov won't look at least as good as he did in his last fight whereas in the case of kasanganai there are several big question marks hanging. Give me Sasha Polotnikov by uh, decision. Next up, it is a light heavyweight matchup featuring Da Eun Jung and William Knight. Jung, the 27-year-old Korean, is 13-2-1 overall. He is 2-0-1 in the UFC. He fought most recently on October 24th of last year at UFC 254, taking a split draw against uh, Sam Alvey, who appears later on this card. That uh, draw would have been by him taking a 10-8 round in the third round, having lost the first two. But one judge saw it that way, the other two saw it two other ways, and hooray, we've got a split draw. Knight, the 33-year-old Connecticut native, is 9-1. He is 
one and zero in the UFC, uh, joining just last September off of Dana White's Contender Series. He knocked out Cody Brundage on September first, then turned around just three weeks later and took a unanimous decision over Alexa Kamer at UFC 253. Jung is the slight favorite here. He is minus 125, minus 130 or so, and Knight is plus 105 to plus 110 as the very slight underdog. Knight, I feel as though I talk about him every single week on these previews just because he's arrived fairly recently and then it feels as though he's had his fights rescheduled so many times. But if you've seen him fight, you know exactly what you're getting. The, he is short for a light heavyweight, but absolutely just muscle on top of muscle. I, I'm the joke observation, I don't know. Uh, after his first weigh-in that he looks like someone tried to make a human being out of bowling balls. Uh, just absolutely jacked. Despite that, has exhibited a pretty good gas tank, and I think part of that might be that he is like 5'9", maybe 5'10", generously. So even though he looks enormous, he might not have a huge cut to get to 205 pounds. He was scheduled to fight Alonzo Menafield. In fact, I think he's been scheduled to fight Menafield twice at this point. And obviously, that was going to be a fun uh, matchup of the two just enormously muscular sluggers. Uh, Menafield, of course, uh, fought just two weeks ago. And Knight is now fighting Jung. This replacement opponent, this switch of opponents, I do not think serves Knight well at all. Because I actually thought, even though Menafield is the bigger version of Knight, Knight is, considering what a short time he's been fighting, actually maybe a, a little more of a refined version of Menafield. And one who has shown himself to have solid three-round cardio, where that's always going to be a question mark with uh, with Alonzo Menafield. Jung is not a good matchup for Knight. Uh, he is a pressure counter-striker, is I think what Keith would call him. He comes forward, he uses feints, he forces the action, but it's all built to get the other guy to swing first so that Jung can return fire. Against the wrong opponent... That can lead to a bit of a staring contest, uh, but Knight is not going to be that op opponent. Knight is more than willing to strike first, and I think the fact that Knight's going to be swinging at a more experienced fighter with longer reach who prefers to counter, it's not going to be good sledding for him. Uh, give me Da Eun Jung over William Knight by second round TKO. For the record, Keith has Jung in this fight as well. We move to the featherweight division for a matchup between Jordan Griffin and Luis Saldana. Griffin, the 31-year-old, is 18-8 and eight overall. He is 1-3 in the UFC, although that 1-3 is slightly deceptive, I would say. The three losses are to Dan Ige, who is a top-10 fighter, Chaz Skelly, who is a borderline top 10 fighter, and Yusef Zalal, who is at least one of the hotter prospects in the division at this time. And he was competitive against all three. I believe he won a round against all three of them. So he's been there against good fighters, but on paper, he is one in three. He'll be taking on Saldana. The 30-year-old is 14 and six overall. He is making his UFC debut after a very successful uh, appearance on Dana White's Contender Series last November, where he knocked out Vince Murdoch. Uh, Griffin, uh, Griffin, I think you know what you're getting with him at this point. He is a huge featherweight, just a titanic guy. Not only is he 5'10 or 5'11, but, I mean, he's got skinny legs, but he has a big, broad upper body. Like, he's got, like, pecs and broad shoulders. So he's a big featherweight, and to an extent, he does fight like it. He will throw a nice long jab. He does like to kick, but he ends up fighting in phone booth distance a lot and ends up just kind of in collision-type situations on the feet a lot. And I haven't figured out yet whether it is because he prefers it that way or he just he doesn't, he doesn't lacks the discipline and gets over-aggressive and just goes charging into the other guy. But for whatever reason, uh, he has the... Uh, tools 
and physical advantages of a big guy for the weight class, but it's anyone's guess the extent to which he will actually take advantage of them in a fight. In comparison, uh, Saldana is a much more disciplined striker. Uh, Saldana likes to fight at, at long range, but he's also comfortable in in like short range, punching range. And from what I've seen of him, I think he has the discipline and the poise to dictate. And this is this is not a great matchup for Griffin, I, I don't think. I have the feeling that, that Griffin is going to do well. He'll probably do well until either early on he just does get over aggressive and starts running into some hard counters, or he starts to wear down in later rounds as he has been shown to do before. I assume his uh, weight cut is enormous, but whatever the reason, he has been shown to fade a little bit later in fights. Uh, you know, I'll split the difference and say Saldana uh, wins this by TKO of kind of an exhausted and beat up Griffin in the third round. For the record, Keith has Saldana in this one as well. Next up on the prelims, we have a fantastic prospect matchup at Bantamweight between Hunter Azure and Jack Shore. Azure, the 29-year-old Montana native, is 9-1 overall. He is 2-1 since joining the UFC off of the third season of Dana White's Contender Series back in 2019. He has beaten Brad Katona, lost to Brian Kelleher in a fight that I believe was two Bantamweights fighting at featherweight, and then came back from that with a win over Cole Smith at UFC Fight Night Overeem versus Sakai last September. Sure, the 26-year-old Welshman is a perfect 13-0 in his mixed martial arts career. He is 2-0 since joining the UFC out of Cage Warriors. He has defeated Nolene Hernandez and Aaron Phillips in that time. He appeared most recently against Phillips last July. The odds right now do slightly favor Shore. At, he's at minus 150 or so, where you can get Azure at plus 130. I'm actually kind of impressed that the odds aren't wider on this, just uh, you know from the hype due to an undefeated prospect coming up. But I feel as though that's about right. Uh, Hunter Azure is what Keith, if he were here, would almost certainly call a classic wrestle boxer, which is his favorite animal to see in the wild. I like them too, as a former wrestler myself. But <clears throat> Azure's got a, a very good uh, takedown game. He has uh, nice doubles, uh, which he is happy to uh, switch to a single. Uh, you know, good. Uh, you know, good second and third effort takedowns on, on his part. He's got a really relentless wrestling game. He has built a good very basic kickboxing game to go with that that uh, has tur turned out to be quite effective. Uh, he's going to have an interesting time against Shore, I think, because uh, Shore is a much better grappler than Stryker at this point in his career. I mean, he's he's still fairly young in terms of fight mileage as well as just flat out in terms of age. But at, at this point, his grappling is definitely his strong suit, he's probably going to be the one that wants this on the ground. And so Azure's going to get to use his good old wrestling in reverse and try to work a sprawl and brawl game on him. I do favor that to work for him, at least in the early going. Uh, he's more of a fast twitch athlete than Shore is. He's probably going to have the advantage in just pure strength uh, and obviously is a much better wrestler. The question will be, what it looks like later on. Azure has, uh, he's gotten tired in all of his fights and he's been the more tired man, win or lose in several of them. So if you're picking Shore in this fight, at least from my point of view, you're probably picking uh, Shore to not do well in the early going, probably lose the first round, trying to get this to the ground as Azure, you know, shucks off his takedown attempts, stays away from him and just, punches him up and you're figuring that Azure will get tired and either you know get tired late and start dropping rounds or get really tired and get tapped out I'm not going to pick the finish here but I do think Shore is going to be able to wear Azure down and and win this one give me Jack Shore by decision uh winning probably the second and third rounds 
Keith has Shore as well. That brings us to our obligatory heavyweight slugfest of the card. This one features Jorgen DeCastro versus Jarges Danholm. DeCastro, the Cape Verdean by way of, I believe it is Fall River, Massachusetts. Ugh, where's Keith when I need him? Is 34 years old. He is 6-2 overall. He is 1-2 since joining the UFC out of Dana White's Contender Series back in 2019. He defeated Justin Taffa with a brutal one-punch knockout in his debut, then has lost back-to-back -back unanimous decisions to Greg Hardy and Carlos Felipe. He takes on Danho, who is Syrian by way of Germany. He is 5-1-1 one, and one with one no contest in his mixed martial arts career. He is 0-1-1 one, and one in the UFC. Most notably, he has not fought in four and a half years. His last appearance was a draw against Christian Colombo back at UFC Fight Night. Arlovsky versus Barnett. Yes, it has been so long since Jarjus Danho has been in the UFC that the last card he fought on was headlined by Josh Barnett. Odds are pretty wide on this one. DeCastro's out there as a minus 300 favorite. Danho uh, plus 250 on the comeback. I think largely because nobody has any idea what Danho is going to look like. He was practically an unknown quantity in 2016. You know, a guy that just kind of came out of uh, regional Middle Eastern promotions to, uh, you know, debut in the UFC and disappeared for four and a half years. We know what we have with DeCastro. He is a short, squat, tank-like heavyweight whose best weapon by far is his low kicks. I, my real problem with uh, DeCastro, it's not even the Felipe loss. Felipe may just be a better fighter. But Hardy, he had that fight. Uh, in the first round, he was landing his leg kicks. They were giving Hardy all kinds of trouble. Hardy landed a couple of good hard punches, and that changed the whole, it changed the whole complexion of the fight. I'm, I mean... I'm never going to sit here in my office chair and call a professional fighter scared. That's not that's not what I'm here to do. But Mike Tyson is the one that said everyone's got a game plan until they get punched in the mouth. Uh, Hardy's power just flipped some sort of switch into Castro, and he did not really pull the trigger for the final two rounds of the fight. That gives me an idea of what his ceiling might be, that you know somebody with sufficient pop and, well, it's heavyweight, most people have a lot of pop, is, is going to be able to knock him out of his game plan. I have no reason to believe that Dan Ho is going to be able to do that. Uh, you know, Dan Ho, all of his wins are by knockout, but again, that's heavyweight, and in particular, he came up as heavyweight in ultra-low-level promotions. Uh, give me uh, DeCastro, and give me DeCastro by TKO. I'm just going to say he does start landing his leg kicks, Danho is compromised. DeCastro starts landing his big old winging uh, right hooks and knocks him out in the second round. For what it's worth, Keith has DeCastro in this one as well. And if you're a regular on this show, you know how much it takes to get Keith to pick a New England fighter. Just saying. We head over to the lightweight division for a matchup between John McDessey and Ignacio Bamondes. McDessey, the 35-year-old Canadian, is 17-7 and overall. He is 10-7 and in the UFC. He fought most recently last March, losing a unanimous decision to Francisco Trinaldo at UFC Fight Night Lee versus Oliveira. That snapped a three-fight winning streak for him. Of course, that winning streak lasted a long time because McDessey fights about once per year, but he did beat Jesus Pinedo, Ross Pearson, and Abel Trujillo uh, previous to that loss to Masaranduba. He will be welcoming Bamondes to the UFC. The 23-year-old Chilean is 11-3 overall. This will be his UFC debut after making a successful appearance on Dana White's Contender Series last November. 
uh, knocking out Edson Gomez with a nasty uh, front kick in the middle of kind of just a wild exchange on the feet, just lanced him right in the face with uh, with a front kick. Uh, Bamondes is the slight favorite here, minus 190. McDessie is plus 165, plus 170 as the underdog. Uh, McDessie, because of his relative inactivity, like I said, he basically fights once per year at this point, I do lose track of how successful he still is. I just always assume that, you know, he's washed up or I haven't thought about him in a while because he lost a bunch of fights. But he's not lost a bunch of fights. In fact, he's not even lost two fights in a row since, like, 2015. It's just that it's so long between his appearances that I forget what he's been doing. His fight against Trinaldo was uh, quite competitive. He is what he is as a fighter at this point. He would love to be a knockout artist. Uh, certainly he presented as a knockout artist when he first arrived in the UFC, but his output within a fight has slowed in much the same way that his fight schedule has slowed. Just, you know, unless he can line somebody up for just a perfect one-shot knockout, it's just not happening, and it hasn't happened for him in probably seven or eight years. Uh, I think Henny Forge was like the last guy he really lanced. Uh, you know, with a single great shot. But nonetheless, you know, he does enough damage to win rounds, and he remains, you know, just super uh, tough, durable, uh, good gas tank. Bamondes, if you didn't see him on the Contender Series, the best thing I can say f about him is that he's from Chile, and he is shaped like his home country. He is a six foot two, six foot three, lightweight. You know, think, uh, think Luis Pena. As you might expect, you know, he is, by preference, an outstriker. And as you might expect, he does have deficiencies in the defensive wrestling department. That's going to happen when your legs are four feet long. Luckily, McDessie is someone who's not really going to test that. I can't remember the last time McDessie, like, was shooting for takedowns. So this is the this is Bob Mondez's fight to lose. I, I expect that... Uh, he's probably going to look pretty good, and he's going to make a successful UFC debut. I'm not going to pick him to uh, finish McDessie. McDessie is super tough, and really the people who have who've knocked out McDessie are the people that were able to take advantage of him hanging out in distance kickboxing range and were just better at it and more willing to throw than he was. Think of Lando Venata, Donald Cerrone, uh, people like that. That I think they both even head kicked him. Anyway, uh, I have uh, Bamondes by a decision in this one, and uh, it looks like so does Keith. We now move to a women's fight that features uh, two women basically meeting in the middle at 135 pounds, or so we hope. We have Norma Dumont, who has actually never successfully made 135 pounds in the UFC. Versus Aaron Blanchfield, who usually fights at flyweight and, for all we know, may never fight at 135 again after Saturday. Uh, Dumont, the 30-year-old Brazilian, is 5-1 and one overall. She is 1-1 one and one in the UFC, having lost to Megan Anderson at featherweight in her debut, then taken a unanimous decision over Ashley Evans-Smith last November in a bantamweight match for which Dumont missed weight by a full five pounds. She weighed in at, I believe, uh, 140 for a bantamweight matchup. Uh, Blanchfield, the 21-year-old Henzo Gracie product, is 6-1 and one overall. She is on a three-fight winning streak, the last two of them in Invicta FC over Victoria Leonardo and Brogan Walker Sanchez. All of those at 125 pounds so as i say she's stepping up on short notice but uh this will definitely be a story of two different women physically i can't even imagine what it must be like for norma dumont because she had been scheduled to fight bia malecki on this card if you do not remember bia malecki from the featherweight season of the ultimate fighter she is a big woman I mean, she might not be quite as big as Megan Anderson, but she's close. She's got to be 5'11", close to six feet tall. Uh, she's not rail thin. It's 
it's surprising to me that she was going to try to fight a bantamweight. And for all I know, that may have contributed to her illness withdrawal from the card. You know, in fact, I would say that Maleki physically is somewhere between Macy Chasson and Megan Anderson. And uh, fittingly, Macy Chasson is someone that you look at her and you're like, how does she make 135? And Anderson is someone you look at and you're like, she could never make 135. Uh, Blanchfield is one heck of a prospect. She is, uh, I mean, as you would expect from a Henzo Gracie product who actually has some grappling uh, accolades under her belt. You know, she is, she's a, a fantastic uh, jiu-jitsu practitioner, you know, threatens with submissions from top as well as bottom. But she has a good, uh, she has a good striking game as well. Uh, I mean, she's a willing puncher. But, you know, really, uh, she is fantastic with the head kicks. Likes to throw them, throws them often, uh, will throw them at different speeds. That's kind of, you know, it's kind of her thing. Really, I think Blanchfield is probably more skilled everywhere than Dumont. But I think the, uh, the size difference is just going to be monstrous. And, I mean, this is assuming Dumont makes weight. But, you know, if, if she makes weight... I have the feeling that Aaron Blanchfield probably walks around around 136 pounds, which is all she needs to make. Uh, she's like five foot four. Blanchfield is not especially bigger than Mackenzie Dern, who was fighting at strawweight later on the card. So I'm picking Dumont to win this one. And for what it's worth, Dumont is a minus 240 favorite. You can get Blanchfield uh, around plus 200. Blanchfield's ceiling is far, far higher. In fact, this might be Dumont's ceiling. If Dumont wins on Saturday, this might go down as her best career win. But this is going to be a bad look for Aaron Blanchfield. I just, I give me Dumont by decision. I think she's just going to be uh, too big for. Her. She's going to uh, be able to handle her on the feet. And Blanchfield's a pretty good wrestler, but. Not necessarily going to be able to get Dumont down. Dumont is, uh, she's strong. She's got a low center of gravity. And yeah, I expect she's going to be able to stay on the feet and just probably kind of beat uh, Blanchfield up in kind of a tepid striking battle. Give me Norma Dumont by decision. Back to the lightweight division for a matchup between Scott Holtzman and Mateus Gamrot. Uh, Holtzman. The man who calls himself Hot Sauce is 14 and 4 overall. He is 7 and 4 in the UFC. He fought most recently last August, getting knocked out by Benil Dariush at uh, UFC Fight Night Lewis versus Olenek. It was a spinning back fist late in the first round that snapped a modest two fight winning streak for the Tennessean. Gamrot, the former two division KSW champion, is 17 and 1 with one no contest overall. Uh, he is 0 and 1 in the UFC, having dropped a split decision to Guram Kutadaladze at UFC Fight Night Ortega versus Korean Zombie last October. Odds do favor Gamrot to bounce back from that first career loss. He is minus 230, where you can get Holtzman around plus 190. Uh, this is Gamrot's, uh, you know. He gets his mulligan. He gets a chance to live up to the hype. He he did come into the UFC as an undefeated two-division champ from KSW and just looked a little flat against Kutataladze. Uh, part of that, I think, is that Gurum Kutataladze is better than we were giving him credit for. But also, Gamrot had been the better wrestler in most of his fights in KSW. That did not carry over to his UFC debut. He was not able to get the fight to the ground, though he wanted to. Uh, his striking looked fine, but basically he just uh, he just kind of fizzled. I am inclined to, like I say, give him a mulligan on that one and let him come out and try again. And I think Holtzman's a good, is a good test for him in, in that regard. Uh, Holtzman, I mean, he's, 37 and yet you know he's 14 and 4 is all just because he was a fairly late starter in MMA 
he is a strong, uh, sturdy, lightweight, not a super fast twitch, explosive athlete at this point in his career, but he's solid everywhere. I mean, he's not going to get, fl- you know, flattened with one strike unless you're Benil Dariuj. He's not going to get just completely, you know, out wrestled, one sided wrestled unless you're Nick Lentz. Uh, otherwise, you know, he's been there, uh, been right there in all of his fights. If Gamrot's wrestling really is going to be good enough to carry over and be uh, a potent offensive weapon for him in the UFC or a potent option, at least in the UFC, he needs to out wrestle Scott Holtzman. And if he's, if his striking, if, you know, his knockout ability is going to carry over to the UFC, he needs to at least be able to hurt Scott Holtzman and do enough damage to affect the fight, win rounds, you know, make Holtzman react and, and change the way he fights. I'm expecting that he's going to. I'm not going to pick him to finish Holtzman. I just, you know, unless unless the Darius loss just broke Holtzman's chin, he's still a really tough out. But give me Gamrot by decision. And Keith has Gamrot in this one as well. The featured prelim of UFC Vegas 23, or UFC on ABC2, features Jim Miller and Joe Selecki in a lightweight contest that was interesting enough that Sherdog associate editor Jay Petri uh, was forced out of hiding to come talk about it with me. Jay, thank you so much for joining us for this featured prelim and for the main card. How are you doing this evening? You know, y'all dragged me out of mothballs, but... I can't think of a better reason than for a Jim Miller fight to, to start things off and talking about some fights. Now, this this ABC card is uh, an unusual ABC card, to, to say the least. And I, I say that with a sample size of exactly one uh, because, you know, there's, there's a lot of varying intrigue uh, and a recent, uh, I guess, on-air rant, I guess we can say, uh, talked about how Jim Miller was, for a while, the, uh, the card opener. So I'm happy that he has been relegated to uh, featured prelim status. But uh, overall, I'm happy to be here. Happy to talk by with you, pal. Um, yeah, let's do it. All right. Uh, Jim Miller, certainly if you are a hardcore enough fan that you're listening to this uh, show, he probably needs no uh, introduction, but he's going to get one anyway. The resident of Sparta, New Jersey, who is depending on when in the year you're asking is the most experienced and tenured fighter in UFC history he is 37 years old. He is 32 and 15 with one, no contest overall. He is 21 and 14 with one, no contest since joining the UFC. He will be squaring off against Selecki. The 27 year old also from New Jersey is 10 and two overall. He is a Sterling two and O since joining the UFC out of the third season of Dana White's Contender Series back in summer of 2019. Despite Miller's enormously superior uh, wealth of experience, he is decidedly the underdog here. Currently, Selecki's out there around minus 235 or so. Miller plus 190, plus 195. Keith, you're not Keith. I'm so used nope. to saying Keith, as soon as I finish introducing the fight, I'm going to completely leave that blooper in so Keith feels so. better about missing this. <laughs> we miss Jay, you, buddy. as one of your many responsibilities for SureDog includes writing uh, odds and betting columns, mm-hmm. before you even pick the fight, do you see any value in the line here? Is is Miller's name value inflating it? Is recent memory of some flat performances of his perhaps deflating it? You know, it's a real interesting thing looking at this fight because Joe Selecki is coming in with a full head of steam. Uh, he he steamrolled Matt Wyman, which this is Matt Wyman 7.0, his sixth return from retirement, you know, one of those things. And then quickly tapped out Austin Thub- uh, Hub- Thud Hubbard, who is a promising his, a prospect in his own right. But I see some some value in this line because of the inherent danger that Jim Miller presents. Like, this is a guy, let, let's let's be honest, He's he's 37 years young. His opponent is 10 years younger than him, almost to the day, by the way. I think it's like three days or so separate them from a 10-year gap. Uh, but Jim Miller, 
I mean, this is almost one of those y'all must have forgot type of fights that I see here. Because Jim Miller is fighting a guy who is a submission grappler first and foremost. So he's and this is a guy in Jim Miller that would also prefer if things go to the ground. You know, we we know he's he's got I believe he is in the top five for the most submissions landed in UFC history on his own right. Um, and a guy who has only been submitted by Charles Oliveira, um, uh, Michael Chiesa, and uh, a young, uh, I guess, more cognizant Nate Diaz. So I feel like there is some value in this line because Miller is such a scrappy, I know how to win, I have the most appearances, I'm almost up there with the most wins in UFC history, that as a as a two to one underdog or more, I feel that's a tough one. I'm I I'm with you on that. Honestly, if this fight, the, the problem with Miller is he's 37, and on one level you want to say, well, he's only 37, and then the flip side of that is, holy cow, I can't believe he's only 37. He has so many years, so many miles on him. We we found out that his his kind of career lull, you know, five years ago was because of undiagnosed Lyme disease. He got that sorted out and came back with some good wins, but he started to just kind of slow down and wear down again. And it's not Lyme disease anymore. It's just that this guy has 36 fights in the UFC and there's nary a softball among them. Some of them turned out not to be great fighters in hindsight, but they were all pretty tough matchups at the time. A, a ton of them were top 10 fighters at the time. He himself was a top five guy for several years there. And if not for kind of coming up at the same time as Frankie Edgar and Gray Maynard, you know, might have, yeah, maybe, maybe he w even would have had a title for a minute. My problem is Joe Selecki is the kind of guy that a few years ago, I would have thought Miller was kind of a, had a sneaky good chance against. My problem with Miller is that his last three fights have shown me that his gas tank is gone now. He's dangerous for about four minutes. I, I learned, I mean, I learned that, especially in the Pichel fight. I picked him to beat Vince Pichel, and I didn't pick him to finish him. I picked him to build up a good enough lead early on that even if Pichel won the third round, Miller still had the fight in his pocket. It just didn't turn out that way. He gassed out quicker, and he never stopped trying to win the fight, but just Pichel was good enough on the ground that he didn't have to be afraid of him, and he just controlled the fight. I see Selecki taking that kind of route to victory. It's hard for me to pick Selecki tapping him out. As you pointed out, the only people that have tapped out Jim Miller are three of the greatest submission artists in the history of the UFC lightweight division. Uh, I mean, numerically superior even to BJ Penn, who was the gold standard forever. Uh, I, I can't pick Selecki to join that select group. Even at this stage in his career, even when he is gassed, Miller is still just a tough, gritty dude who really knows how to survive, especially on the ground. But I've got Selecki here by probably Pichel-like decision. Like, Miller might threaten with some stuff early on, win the first round. Selecki wins the second and third going away, and it's just kind of another bummer to watch. Tell me I'm wrong. I wish I could, man. I really, truly, just just as a as a longtime fan of the sport, as a Jim Miller is about in, in, in a day and a half, going to have as many UFC fights as he has years on this planet. Like, this is a guy who, who it's it's hard not to root for him and be objective as even a media person. I mean, you know, we, we, we try not to be fans of any fighter, but when we see guys like Jim Miller go, we have more respect for him and, and reverence, I guess, maybe that's the word, reverence for man. He's been doing this for so long. He's been fighting, as you said, the best fighters out there. Like, this is a guy who, who just a couple of years ago, very closely came to winning a decision over Dustin Poirier, who I don't know if y'all have seen him lately, but he's done some pretty good things in the cage. Uh, Jim Miller is truly, and his last four wins have all been first round submission. So... It is clear where he's going with it. it. It is either I'm better on you in the ground and I'm going to take advantage of it, or you can match me and I'm out of luck. This is this is the 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 approach that you mentioned that Pichel was able to simply outmuscle him and and bully him and wrestle him to the canvas and keep him there and not fall into any traps is a very 
uh, uh, replicable result for Joe Selecki because that's exactly what he did to Matt Wyman. He just kind of bullied him. He used his young man aggression, which I don't know if Jim Miller has old man strength yet. I don't know if he's at that level yet. But this is a Jim Miller who is feast or famine these days. And that's a real tough ask against a guy who is legit on the ground, who is the kind of foil that can say, I can at least hang with Jim Miller on the ground. I cannot fall into a trap. I cannot suddenly have my back taken or leave my neck exposed like Clay Guida and can put to sleep, or 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 kind of loosen up a little when I'm on top and fall into an arm bar like Roosevelt Roberts. This is a guy in Joe Selecki who hasn't shown me he has those mental lapses yet. So while I want to, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to totally botch this here because there is, I, I still firmly believe there is value in Jim Miller as a plus 200 underdog, but as a straight pick him, I have to go with Joe Selecki by a decision, by a, by the third round we go, by, well, no, I take it back, by about the two minute, three minute mark of round two, we go, okay, I, I know what's going to happen for the rest of this fight. Um, and, and we kind of look and go, well, what do we do with Jim Miller now? Because Joe Selecki's a young, you know, a young Thundercat, but he's hardly an established name that makes you go, boy, I'd love to see him, I'd love to see Jim Miller fight again. So this is... This is a tough spot that Jim Miller's in, so we'll we'll see how much how much time we have left with him. But I'm going to enjoy the first round for as long as it lasts, at least. There you go, two fairly comfortable yet uncomfortable picks for Joe Selecki in the prelim headliner. The UFC on ABC Two main card kicks off with a welterweight attraction featuring. Platinum Mike Perry and D-Rod Daniel Rodriguez. Perry, the 29-year-old Floridian, is 14-7 and seven in his mixed martial arts career. He is an even 7-7 seven and seven since joining the UFC. Rodriguez, the 34-year-old Californian, is 13-2 and two overall. He is 3-1 and one since joining the UFC last February. He fought most recently at UFC 255 in November, losing to Nicholas Dalby by unanimous decision. That put an end to the three-fight winning streak with which he had started his UFC career. Odds still favor uh, Rodriguez just slightly. He is out there at minus 170, minus 175 or so. You can get Perry on the comeback at plus 155. Jay Petri, tell me first off how crazy it is that Mike Perry is still not 30 years old. And then tell me who you think wins this fight. Man, Mike Perry has the 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 mileage of a fighter. You go, oh my gosh, this guy has to be 35 and we're talking about the tail end of his career. All right, he's done the things, he's got the knockouts and we're going to wind it up here. But this is a kid who theoretically, according to you know biology and whatnot, should be entering his prime. But as we know, the fight game was a fickle mistress. Uh, he had approached the middleweight limit in his last time out when he came in, what I believe five pounds heavy when he fought Tim Means, and yeah. uh, just didn't, just wasn't in, what wasn't in the fight, wasn't in the fight itself, wasn't in the pre thing. Now that he's independent fighter, as we know that the very uh, public exchange about him breaking for Fusion Excel and leaving those team members and saying, I can do it better myself. I can train in my garage or with, with buddies or whatever exactly he's doing. I'm not sure. Uh, I don't believe he has changed his training camp. So please correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure Mike Perry is still um, doing an independent thing. Now, I don't like to play MMA math, but, but Tim Means pieced him up. Let, let's be honest. Uh, he outlanded him by a two, an exactly two to one clip. Um, of all the oddities of that fight with Mike Perry and Tim Means, it was that Mike Perry a hit the takedown and two almost got a rear naked choke in the first round. Like this is a where did that grappling thing come from Mike Perry? Because I guess he learned his lesson when when Donald Cerrone armbarred him and he kind of was foolish enough to go to the ground with him. But this is a Mike Perry who's not doesn't seem to be in it to win it, and. That's a tough ask to go against Erod, uh, Daniel Rodriguez, who appears. I mean, his 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 loss to Nicholas Dalby was was competitive. Um, they they were toe to toe. Like this this was a a one lands the other lands. They were taking turns. 
Um, Dalby was getting off good head kicks. They were both busting each other open. There was blood. It was that was kind of that kind of fight where Nicholas Dalby edged him. And that, to me, was like a quintessential what we're going to see from Daniel Rodriguez type of fight. He ain't afraid of a brawl. He, he is not afraid to step, to, to, to get in the pocket and throw bombs. And that is the worst thing to do with Mike Perry. But I still, above all, don't have enough confidence in Mike Perry to, to, to favor him, even in the place that Mike Perry should excel the best. Like this is the the one thing you don't want to do is just trade right hands with Mike Perry. You don't want to get in there and let him just just go punch for punch. And he points at his chin and slaps it and goes, "Come on, hit me!" And they do that thing. That's the one thing you don't want to do. And yet I still favor D Rod to to get the better of those exchanges. I don't know if it's because of what he did to Dwight Grant, um, or or how he put away Tim Means. He was hurting him and then he tapped him out. I I can't. I just can't in good conscience, see if Mike Perry gets outboxed by Mickey Gall, what a, a sharper striker is going to do against him. So I have Daniel Rodriguez in this fight. Um, I'm going to say I don't think he's going to replicate what Jeff Neal did and smoke him in 90 seconds, but I can see probably an accumulation of damage in like the second round. Uh, Daniel Rodriguez gets the, gets the TKO, uh, he gets him against the fence and he pounds him out. And then Mike Perry complains, hey, I wasn't done as he's stumbling across the cage. So yeah, give me Daniel Rodriguez by second round TKO. Just so you know, this show would be a lot more interesting if we disagreed on a few things. So if you would like to get cracking on that for the remainder of the main card, right, I would sure me, appreciate let me, let me it. Take my notes. My, my problem is Perry, I mean, Perry obviously two fights ago ahead of the Mickey Gall fight very famously just quit with teams entirely and said, my girlfriend's going to train me or you know, my girlfriend's going to corner me. I'm going to train alone. And the win over Gall only encouraged him, which means he tried it against a serious UFC level opponent in Tim Means and, and got his uh, lunch handed to him. But even before that happened, I felt as though he was sliding and, just degrading enormously in a technical sense. When he came into the UFC, obviously he made a huge sensation for some of the wrong reasons, obviously, but for some of the right reasons, he was knocking people out and he wasn't just a guy with one weapon, like just this crazy, you know, overhand right or something. He killed Jake Ellenberger with a level elbow. Uh, he wiped out, who was it? The uh, Danny Roberts. Uh, you know, he he nailed him with uh, just a beautifully timed knee. He stopped doing that. Now he is basically a, a one-weapon slugger. And he's become a one-weapon slugger as he's ascended into fighting tougher competition. They're not giving the guy any any easy outs anymore. I mean, he's fighting Vicente Luque, Jeff Neal, you know, Tim Means. He, you know, T Tim Means is is still just a super tough, gritty veteran. I don't, I, I don't believe in Perry anymore. And I don't know if I would, even if he were still with a conventional team, but I know I definitely don't in the situation he's in right now. And I'm with you in that Rodriguez is probably going to oblige Perry with the kind of fight that gives him his best chance to get a knockout. But not only has he not knocked anybody out in the UFC in three and a half years, when's the last time he even hurt somebody really bad? I think it's Paul Felder when he broke his arm checking a kick. Maybe that, or I think he had Alex Oliveira on roller skates for a little bit. Yeah, but everybody has Alex Oliveira on that's roller true. skates. Well, Alex Oliveira kind of was on roller skates himself, yeah. like asking himself out. Oh, that's true. That's yeah. true. Like, like well, I'm, and I'm, I'm not taking away from that. He beat Oliveira, and it's his yeah. last really, it's his last win over someone who's like UFC quality. But <laughs> it, it's not like he, it's not like he was killing people early on. I just feel as though his strikes are, you know, they're more telegraphed now. And early in his uh, UFC tenure, it was the strike you didn't see coming that killed you. His combination of just speed, athleticism, and a broad range of techniques was unbeatable. I, I, I've got Rodriguez in this one big time. Perry might have him in a little bit of trouble at some point in the first round as Rodriguez comes forward face first and eats something. But I don't think it'll be enough to finish him. And maybe Rodriguez will flash a little of that 10th planet jujitsu. Give me Rodriguez by 
you know, maybe guillotining a hurt and tired Perry in the third round, but give me uh, Rodriguez by a third round submission. And the question from there will be, what is next for Mike Perry? You know, does he make the Shillin and Duffy cut list? Do they find, I mean, do they just start giving him to the people fresh off the contender series? Half of whom, at least half of whom are not long for the UFC themselves. I mean, that almost merits its own very brief discussion, even though it's it's hard to preview a fight that we're expecting is going to happen. We both expect that Mike Perry will be finished. Um, and, and in the event this does, this is an if-then statement, that they I mean, it'll be four losses in his last five. It'll be a couple finishes if, it, if he gets finished. Um, and he's an expensive fighter to have on the roster. This is a guy who I remember early on was taking home 90 grand, 90-90. 90-90 is a pretty hefty salary for a fighter who has... Uh, let's see. I believe he is closing in on a 500 record if he doesn't already have it. He is exactly 500 yeah. right now. He's seven yeah. and seven. Yeah, so that's a. Be... It's hard. That's a real hard sell to to keep him going. But I, I suppose we'll save that for for Mr. Schillen when he comes back around. But hey, he'll be get, getting that big eleven thousand from Venom instead of ten thousand from Reebok. Big bucks, no whammies. We soldier on in the women's strawweight division with a matchup between Nina Nunez and Mackenzie Dern. Nunez, the newly official Mrs. Nunez, well, they've been officially married for a while, but she has officially now taken the name of two-division champ Amanda Nunez. She is 35 years old. She is 10-6 and six overall, 4-3 and three in the UFC. She is taking on... Dern, Mrs. I cannot remember uh, her. I don't even know if it's her husband. Is it just her fiance that she has the kid with? Either way, she has kept the name Dern and she is 28 years old. She is 10 and one overall. She's five and one in the UFC. And currently, as of Thursday evening, when we're recording this, Anstrop is just a slight favorite. She is minus 115, minus 120. You can still find Dern as the even money underdog out there at plus 100. I gotta say, I'll I'll give my pick in just a moment, but I'm actually surprised that Ansaroff is the favorite here. I'm kind of wondering what that's being based off of. Uh, both of them have looked pretty good recently, but in terms of sheer recency, uh, Nunez lost her last fight in pretty uncontroversial fashion, albeit to an outstanding fighter in Tatiana Suarez, whereas Dern is on a three-fight win streak. This presents as, to me, it presents as a pretty classic striker versus grappler matchup. Nunez is going to want to beat her up. I mean, she can grapple, but she's going to want to beat her up on the feet and stay off the ground. Dern has always been a willing striker almost to a fault throughout her entire career, but obviously her specialty as the daughter of the great uh, Wellington GS is she's a grappler. She's one of the greatest, most decorated women ever to do it. The question then becomes, can Dern get it to the ground? We saw, we saw Amanda Hebus pretty much deny her, and Hebus was good enough on the feet to punish her for trying. Uh, I'm starting to really embrace the philosophy as you know, again, I'm not a professional fighter, but as an observer and an analyst, I'm beginning to uh, embrace the philosophy that part of takedown defense is making the person pay for trying. Like if somebody goes 0 for 9 on takedown attempts in a round, how did they even get to 9 attempts? You know, like the really great uh, takedown defenders are the ones that are hurting the other person for trying. Uh, and Hebus was able to do that uh, to Dern and then obviously able to handle herself better than Dern on the feet. I don't know if Nunes can do that. Dern's wrestling entries have always been ugly. She will still just kind of bend at the waist and run at you. But if she can get you in the clinch, she's been good from the clinch. She has trips, throws. She is a strong, she's just a strong athletic woman, especially at 115, especially now that, strangely enough, in the wake of having a child, she's gotten the weight cut more under control. But... She's not Tatiana Suarez from a standpoint of just sheer power, but I think she's going to be bigger and stronger than Nunez. Nunez like looks like a ripped little athlete, but I think Dern is going to have the strength and power advantage when they get their hands on each other. So my thought is just as simple as that. I think Dern is going to be able to close the distance on Nunez 
get her hands on her and just figure out a way to get her to the ground. Nunez is a good striker, but she's not a the kind of kill shot artist that I think the first time she hits Dern, Dern's just going to go, oh my God, what am I doing? And be gun shy for the rest of the fight. So Nunez might, might even win the first round. Might, well, she might win the first two rounds. But at some point, second or third round, Dern's going to be able to get her to the ground. She's going to go to work and give me Mackenzie Dern by a rear naked choke. And I will say second round just for fun. Yeah, I, I, I feel bad. I apologize, listeners. I don't like to apologize on broadcast. I'm not going to do what other broadcasters do. But I apologize for the fact that we're not disagreeing on this pick. Um, <laughs> I, I, and this is an upset pick, by the way. This is a minor upset. Uh, you, you can find... Um, uh, Mackenzie Dern at, you know, around plus 120, 110, 125, depending on the books you look at. And I feel that's a little tough. Also, well, I un- I understand it. Here's the thing. I understand it because Nina Nunes, Ney Ansaroff, uh won the third round against Tatiana Suarez and made people go, oh my gosh, is Tatiana Suarez beatable? And she has a pretty respectable list of of, of of bodies, if you will, you know, Claudia Gadelia is no easy out. Um, she she bullied around uh, Randa Marcos, um, uh, Angeli Angie Hill, and oh geez, uh, Jocelyn Jones Linebar. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it's 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 a good win streak she's put together, but she's been away for coming up on two years. Now, obviously, she's been away for coming up on two years for for a good reason. But in that span, Mackenzie Dern has fought four times. She lost, and then she's gone on this win streak, and this is. I think momentum is severely in Dern's favor. You know, it's it's funny. You said it, and I did prep for this fight, but I still don't believe that Nunes is a thir- is thirty five years old. Like I just don't, I just don't see that in her her the way she fights, anything like that. But we do know historically, as you cross that thirty five plus uh, threshold for lighter weight fighters, things start to go on you. I mean, unless you're Marion Renault, you're going to have a tough time as as you get older. And Mackenzie Dern's what twenty eight. She's just a she's just a baby, and she had a baby. Which by the which by the way, she is married. Um, because I remember that controversy of them both being thrown out of Black House. Um, and that was a whole big dramatic moment. Uh, look, I, I want to ask you something first because this is something I actually I wanted to touch on, and I'm happy you mentioned it first. When you said it's a classic striker versus grappler matchup, I we say it all the time. It's it's an overused cliche, but it's accurate a lot of the time. But when it comes to women's MMA, do you find we say that very often? Because I don't feel we say that very often. You make a good point. We probably don't say it as often. And it's interesting because I feel as though it probably happens more often in women's divisions. I think there are more peer specialists left kind of at the UFC level in the top 20 to 30 of their respective divisions in the women's divisions. And I'm not saying that makes them better or worse. It's just you know, it's what we see. And yet we, we don't say it as often. Maybe it's the way they're matched. Yeah. I, I don't know. It, it's just, it's an oddity that I, I can pick, I can go back and th- see matches. I'm like, well, that's obviously a striker versus grappler matchup, but why was it not painted this way? Uh, anyway, getting back to this fight itself, this is a classic striker versus grappler matchup in that, uh, Nina Nunes is going to press the pace with volume. She's going to put her hands in her face. One thing she won't, or shouldn't probably do, maybe shouldn't is the operative word, is kick. Because she can mix in sprinkling kicks, leg kicks, body kicks, stuff like that. I wouldn't do that with Mackenzie Dern. Now, I I think of her, now, when I make this comparison, I don't mean in terms of legacy, but just in terms of approach and style, she's a female Damian Maya. She cannot get the fight to the ground. Um, I think historically she's one for 18 on official UFC takedown attempts. One out of 18 she's landed. But she has more she has more submissions than submission wins than successful takedown attempts. Now it's because it, she might not be able to get it there, but the fight's going to get there some way. Whether it's it's Brandon Marcos making the worst decision of her life, not standing up, or whatever, it gets there. How did that happen? Oh my God, she has my neck. I'm gonna die. I, I it's an unusual kind of approach, and I see. I see Mackenzie Dern. She loves to wing her power punches to close the distance. They have some power. They hurt ABC. Well, now uh, ABB, but they hurt ABC Cooper um, when she was just spamming those big right hands before she got the, the uh, got her down and tapped her out. Those big power punches can do some surprising damage. They can hurt. And if Nunes isn't careful, 
and, and doesn't stick the jab out there and, and keep her at bay, she might be surprised. But the tool for the big looping shot is obviously for Dern to push forward, get the fight to the to the to the wall, um, pull guard, trip, do whatever she has to do, force a funky scramble. The the most important thing that Dern can do is don't stay on the outside getting punched in the face and and you take body shots. It's the worst possible outcome. So I just see her almost to a detrimental degree during just going forward, like unrelenting. I'm going to walk straight at you and, and maybe not necessarily work angles to cut you off because, because Nunes is pretty, pretty adept at being able to circle out in the cage, uh, you know, jab, pop, pop, left, step on it straight to the left and get out of danger. Whereas Dern is definitely more uh, of a linear approaching uh, a fighter. But I think the fight will inevitably get to the ground and Nunes is going to find herself in the danger zone instantly. Like this is this is one of those things that hits the ground. There is such a chasm of, of skill level. Like Nunes is a good good enough defensive grappler. Uh, she's been taken down a lot, which is funny for somebody who has this decent takedown defense as she has still managed to get taken down twice a fight. You know, you you can almost it's like clockwork. Justine Kitch is going to get her down a couple times. Claudia Gadelia is going to get her down a couple times, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And yet she doesn't stay down for long. But this is that kind of fight where you just don't want to be down there. And it's not that she can stop it. It that she could easily stop Mackenzie Dern's takedowns because, as you pointed out, they're very uh, flimsy. We'll, we'll put it that way to, to be politic. But she has just Mackenzie Dern has this bizarre way of somehow being like, well, how did we how did we end up down here? Who did that? Did you do that? I don't know um, that I think that's going to play to her advantage. And I think she's going to um, get the job done. I don't think she's going to get the submission. I, I think Nunes is just adept enough to survive. But I think she may find herself going, oh, I think I immediately regret this decision. I should not have let her clinch me. Um, give me Dern by decision. We now head to the middleweight division, just in time to meet Sam Alvey there, assuming he makes weight successfully on Friday, as it marks his return to the division after a lengthy jaunt with mixed results at light heavyweight. He will be meeting Julian Marquez, who's returned to the sport in general. Alvey, the 34-year-old, is 33 and 14 with one draw and one no contest, in his uh, well-traveled career. He is 10, 9, and 1 since joining the UFC. Marquez, the Kansas City native, is 30 years old. He is 8 and 2 overall. He is 2 and 1 since joining the UFC off of the very first season of Dana White's Contender Series. His relatively uh, thin resume since then reflects over two years away from the game between July 2018 and uh, just this past February, when he made a return and got a sensational comeback win over Maki Patolo at UFC 258. Uh, Marquez is your moderate favorite here. He's minus 185 or so. Alvi you can get at plus 155 or plus 160. Uh, Sam Alvi to me, sometimes feels like he's a fixture who's been in the UFC forever. Uh, certainly, you know, he's... He feels like one of the better known characters in the UFC for a guy who's never quite made it into actual top 10 contention. Uh, it's, I mean, it's worth saying, like maybe it's an indication of how universally beloved or at least universally accepted he is that he's on a card with Mike Perry and he is a guy that ha has had his wife in his corner forever and nobody says word one about it. And I don't know if it's because she's a model or because they are just so obviously, adorably, like, in love. I don't know what it is, or maybe it's that she's secretly a great coach, and everybody knows that but me, but for whatever reason, we completely accept that uh, Mrs. Alvey is in the corner. Presumably, she will be this weekend. Who have you gotten this one, Jay? You know, it's, it's funny, I, before we get anybody, it, it is funny how I, I think maybe that Alvey and his wife are, are in the same corner together, or she's cornering him, because that's how it's always been. It isn't. It isn't a sudden change to go from, uh, uh, you know, somebody uh, a highly regarded coach and somebody at Fusion Excel to, who's that? 
who's that lady? It, it, it's just kind of, it, it, it's become almost an institution in its own right. I mean, she, he's had 20 fights and, and it's a perfect, it's, it's about to be, well, you know, to not give anything away. Well, we'll see what happens. Sam Alvey has about as much rope as he possibly can have for, for a guy who has not won a fight uh, in, we're coming up on three years now and it was a split decision. Uh, and I, boy, I, if memory serves, it was one with John Vellante. Uh, and I think it was the kind of fight where you go, you know, I think Vellante might have been able to take that one. I, I, and and then he, a couple of knockouts, up a division, uh, tough performances. The Ryan Span was a little iffy. The Don Jung was also iffy. He's, he's, he's had some hot fights lately. At his age, he's only 34. He's not an old man. He's, you know, my age. Uh, dropping down to middleweight, I just always look at that and go, is that going to solve your problems on a on a winless stretch? Uh, maybe, but not against a guy in, in Julian Marquez who let me let me give you a real quick stat here. So he fought in February and then he asked out um, what's her name Miley Cyrus and that whole mess happened. So that was in February. This is April. Uh, April tenth will be his next fight. This is the quickest turnaround he's ever had between two fights in his pro career. Period. The end. Like, this isn't a guy who went, won six fights in, like, eight months or whatever. He's always had uh, a, a gap between his next several fights. Uh, and, and this is, I think this this activity is going to do him well. I think this is a guy who had needed to build momentum and was derailed in the worst fashion off of a close loss to Alessio De Chirico. He found We found out y'all must have forgot about him when he ruined Joaquin Buckley and booted that guy in the head. But... Not to take anything away from uh, Julian Marquez, he came back, and then he he was a back and forth battle with Maki Patolo, hit the anaconda choke at the last what was it last minute I think, mm-hmm. and and showed people that he still can hang. He's a nose first, swinging. Let's see what happens. Let the chips fall where they may. Kind of striker when when he approaches these fights, he's gonna throw head kicks. He's gonna throw big power shots. He's gonna throw a little too hard. And this is the kind of situation that Sam Alby will be okay with because he is he has this this stance and this striking style that I can't think of many fighters that have had it either. I mean he's he's a southpaw and he fights with a long, straight left hand and a check a quick right hook. That is pretty much his bread and butter. And it works and it hasn't worked lately, but when it works, it it does, it speaks volumes. So I can see Sam Alvey having some success in the early going, but this weight cut is just so gnarly for 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 a guy like Alvey, who has a lot of miles, who has been at 205, uh, who who's been going through some tough spot, and I, I just see it him waning as the fight goes on, and I, I think that Marquez won't. I I don't have the only thing I don't have the confidence completely is that Marquez will finish this fight. Uh, which would be a first, by the way. Marquez has a 100% finish rate. Uh, and Alvy isn't perfect in his chin, but he usually can keep it out of harm's way. I I think Marquez is just, he hits hard enough to keep, to draw your respect and get your attention. And unless Alvy catches him and surprises him and does that power, what we talked about in the, in, the, in the news fight, that one shot change your approach in the fight, that, oh, what did you just hit me with kind of strike? Unless Alvi lands that kind of thing, I think that uh, Marquez's confidence is going to grow as he's back in the cage. He's performing again. He's going to ask out Taylor Swift or something. He's got all of that stuff going in his head. He's ready for the big stage. And I feel like on the main card of ABC, this is probably one of those moments where he gets that win uh, and and puts himself and makes people go, boy, is he ready for the for the top 15? So I'm going to go with Marquez. I'm going to break his finish record I don't think he's going to 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 stop Sam Alvey. Uh, he might have Alvey hurt, but Alvey still has some excellent recoverability. Uh, Ryan, his, his fight with Ryan Spann was a very surprising contest, um, and and the, the fight with Daoyuan Chung, I believe he lost a ten eight round in the in the uh, in the third round and was fading pretty pretty significantly. Correct me if I'm wrong there. Um, but he had the survivability to keep going, which tells me he still has that kind of wherewithal to to get through a tough fight and survive so i'm going to go with julian marquez uh by decision 
I feel pretty much the entire dynamic you're laying down there. My The place I'm going to diverge from you is that I question whether Alvi's survivability and gas tank will be the same with this cut. That, that's what really concerns me. And, I mean, it's worth pointing out that, yeah, like, Marquez's last win over Patolo was a fight that he really just took control of in the last, you know, 60 to 90 seconds. And otherwise, you know, Patolo was cruising to a pretty straightforward decision. So, like, Marquez got the sensational finish. It was a rousing fight. I stood up from my couch and said, yay. But it wasn't a steamrolling. Like, there, it left plenty of questions about Marquez because Patolo just basically uh, pieced him up for, for the first two rounds. Similarly, Alvi's last fight, I mean, it's officially a split draw with Dao and Jung. But I had him winning that fight. Basically, you had to give Jung a 10-8 third round in order for that to be a draw in, in any way, really, because uh, Alvi had won the first two rounds, 10-9, to 9, in pretty straightforward fashion. All three official sure dog scores, including yourself, scored the final round, 10-9 Jung. So, oh, yes, I, I scored the fight for Alvi. Yeah, yeah, I scored the fight for Alvi, and I felt the same way. Uh, I just... Alvi has always, whether at middleweight or at light heavyweight, whether he was 26 years old, 32, 34, he's always been an incredibly plodding fighter. Like, he's not blessed with spectacular hand and foot speed to start with. Then he has a very deliberate style in which, as you pointed out, you know, kind of strange for a southpaw, he, you know, sets up, he sets up the power punch from the hand that you don't typically expect. And because of that, it, it makes him look even more kind of deliberate and waiting and waiting and waiting. But I can't get past the incredibly shopworn and ancient uh, little nog just beating him to the punch and basically blitzing him out of there in, in seconds, in, in the second round of their fight. You expect that from Jimmy Crute, who's super young and like like clearly a freakish explosive athlete. You don't expect it from, from little nog. And Alvi's the same fighter, only you know, two years older since then. I could see Marquez catching him with something and putting him down early. I'm not going to pick that. I am going to pick Marquez to win the war of attrition severely enough that the finish is there for the taking in the third round. He certainly could, you know, hop on a guillotine. He likes those. He's good at taking the back and getting the rear naked choke. But I'm going to say he finishes it just either with ground and pound or with just like punches against the cage as Alvi kind of melts and turtles and is just exhausted and done. And then the UFC is really going to have uh, a mess on its hands as to what to do, you know, with one of its more recognizable and lovable personalities. Give me Julian Marquez by round three TKO. That brings us to the co-main event of UFC on ABC2. It is a featherweight attraction featuring two red-hot featherweight prospects in Arnold Allen and Sadiq Youssef. Allen, the 27-year-old Brit, is 16-1 and overall. He is a perfect 7-0 and since joining the UFC. He will face Youssef, the 27-year-old as well, is 11-1 and overall. He is 4-0 and since joining the UFC out of the uh, second season of Dana White's Contender Series back in 2018. Odds in this one slightly favor Yusuf. He is uh, minus 130 or so. You can get Allen at plus 105 or plus 110 as the underdog. Uh, this is an absolutely sensational fight. It's my pick for fight of the night. It's my pick to deserve fight of the night, even if there's just some sloppy slobber knocker that wins it. Uh, you know, see you know, Jorgen de Castro's uh, prelim fight or something like that. I don't know. But this this is a fantastic fight. If you can get to 7-0 and in one of the deepest divisions in the UFC quietly, I feel as though Arnold Allen has done so. And I think he's done so because he's come along kind of gradually. You have to get a little ways in there before you start even really recognizing names. Like... I mean, Makwan Amerikani is a recognizable name, but it's mostly because it's a unique name and he's Mr. Finland and he's all handsome and stuff. But in terms of being a contender, like he's not a name. It's in his last couple of fights where it's, you know, Gilbert Melendez, Nick Lentz, where he's just very appropriately being matched with former contenders who are on the way down, 
the you know the backside of the escalator which is you know the perfect thing that a hot prospect in his 20s should be getting but because of that because he didn't just come in and just start blowing people out of their sneakers like mike perry he's he's gotten to where he is pretty quietly uh yusuf is only four and oh in the ufc and i feel as though it's i i feel as though he's gotten more attention uh, you know, maybe some higher profile fighters in there. You know, Andre Feely, obviously. Uh, he's had a couple of spectacular finishes. He has a, a very effervescent personality. Uh, like, I, it will forever kill me that he calls himself Black Explosive. You know, cl- clearly he's a guy that's uh, listened to a few uh, UFC podcasts or uh, UFC broadcasts uh, in, in his time. As far as how this one plays out, Alan has been brought along very sensibly. This is the first time he's fighting a fellow prospect on the way up who's roughly at the same level. And that gives me a problem because in all of his fights so far, at least at the UFC level, he has benefited from being the bigger and stronger guy and the better athlete. He might be a little bigger than Yusuf, but he like he won't have the advantage in speed and explosion, even though he is a, a very good athlete himself. And I'm kind of interested to see how his stand-up game goes against someone who darts in and out and explodes with individual power shots with the the speed and power of Sadiq Yusuf. And even though uh, Yusuf has a couple of, you know, just crazy knockouts on his, uh, on his record, his most unsung weapon and the thing that won him his fight on the Contender Series is he has a, just a brutal low calf kick that just it whips out and he throws it, he throws it often when he's feeling it and it starts to pay dividends immediately. Like he won a decision over Davis that if it kept going, that thing was, Dick Davis was, was on bad wheels at that point. Uh, so the difference in speed between Yusuf and Allen might become even more apparent if Yusuf starts landing those early. I'm kind of interested to see how Allen will uh, react to those. I expect this fight to take place entirely on the feet unless somebody gets hurt so badly that they want to bring it to the ground thinking it's a safe place. I don't even expect too much clinch work unless it's Allen saying, okay, this guy is too quick. I've got to try to walk him into the fence and, you know, kind of put this fight in the mud. Beyond that, I'm just expecting a a spectacular, you know, kickboxing match with some clinching from uh, two very good up and coming featherweights. I do favor use of slightly in this one. I'm not, an odds man i'm really not a better but if i had to handicap this fight i'd place it about like it is yusuf a very slight favorite and i very slightly favor yusuf to win uh the decision here and if anything i will say that he will probably be pulling ahead in the later rounds as his work on leg kicks starts to kick in and he maybe starts to wear on alan's gas tank alan is a big featherweight He's been fine so far gas tank wise, but he's been able to dictate the pace in pretty much all of his previous fights. That may not be the case against Yusuf. And if Yusuf puts it on him, Allen might be flagging by the end of the fight. Give me Sadiq Yusuf by unanimous decision. Is it possible to simultaneously love and hate a matchup? Because you love the fact that these two guys are fighting now, right at the, at the point like there, it is undeniable. I would say personally that that each of them are fighting the, the toughest opponent they've ever fought before. Like, Arnold Allen's the best fighter that Sadiq Yusuf's fought. Sadiq Yusuf is the best guy that Arnold Allen has fought. So I love the fight from that that next level type of bout that we get out of it where, where you know, two men enter, one man leaves, and he's in a place to, to finally start calling the shots. But I hate it because it means one of these guys is going to have to lose. Like, this is a guy on Arnold Allen who is on a longer win streak than Sadiq Yusuf has been a professional fighter. So, in that in that Allen's win streak started before Sadiq went pro. Uh, Arnold Allen has impressed me, not just because of the, his ability to, to, to dictate fights and, and put it where he wants to, but it's that he doesn't really seem to get tired. Even when Nick Lent spams, you know, north of a dozen takedowns on him, it doesn't really show on him to a degree, and he's forced to to fight off them. And he kind of make made Nick Lent pay in a way that we talked about earlier. That that if you're going to let a guy shoot in on you that many times, you're gonna have to you're gonna make him answer for it. Bust him out, I mean, Nick Lent, you know, gets cut of the stiff breeze, but still the kind of 
do the damage to make him go, okay, maybe I shouldn't do that. Um, I'm with you in that I believe this is going to be a firmly stand-up fight. Unless Arnold Allen gets 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 lit up, I believe he's the, the, the two that would take this fight down, probably clinch up, uh, go for a body lock, a trip, something like that, uh, to, to try and slow down the, the quick hands of Yusuf. Because Yusuf is a volume, hard-hitting, fast-striking, he's going to put his hands in your face, and he's going to kick your legs off unless you stop him. And, and nobody has stopped him in the UFC to date. Um, and Andre Feely gave it an honest effort. Uh, he he really did try to take him out of his game by hitting takedowns, by pulling for some, going for some sort of a submission. But it wasn't enough to take Yusuf out of his game. I feel Allen isn't as good of a grappler as Feely, because Feely's always been a deceptively sneaky grappler. I don't know if it's with his time in Team Alpha Male or just the way he fights, and it's the fact that he's kind of just an odd duck across the board. It's a good odd duck. Don't worry, Andre Feely. We love you. But it's it's an unusual... If there's such a thing as herky-jerky grappling, there you go. Like, and, and and Yusuf was able to shuck off what he needed to shuck off, get back to his feet, uh, not stay on his back for too long, which is an important thing for a guy in, you think, taking the striker out of the element uh, would be to take them down. But if I remember correctly, Sadiq Yusuf actually had more control time uh, than Andre Feely did. So that tells you that the use of can, uh, can get out of danger, can, can scramble, can reverse a bad situation. I don't think it's going to get there. And I like what we've seen by Sadiq Yusuf's power, his combinations, pop, pop, low leg kick. You know, it's not just going to be a naked shot. It's not going to just be a winging, big, crazy, silly nonsense. It's going to be a, a measured, but very, very quick attack. So I give him the edge on that by the striking uh, because I don't believe that Arnold Allen, I mean, he, he he's he's effective and he's a, a good boxer as well, but I don't see him as that. If, if that makes sense, um, I, I see him as more of an all well-rounded guy, whereas I see Yusuf as a guy who stand up as his, where he's going to go here. Um, I'm also going to roll with this. I feel like we're not going to disagree on anything until the main event, but let's get weird. Um, I'm going to go with Sadiq Yusuf uh, on the scorecards as well. I'm not going to say unanimous decision or split decision because whoever who would ever say that unless you're going to be in the minds of all three judges at the same time. So I'm just going to take Sadiq Yusuf by decision um, and, and say this is going to be a real fun fight. Uh, it's it's good matchmaking, it, it's, which is which is something I feel we've, we've struggled with lately, that, that UFC is derided about its matchmaking policies and how it's been running things and why are they fighting. That doesn't make sense. This is one of those fights that, okay, it makes sense. I love it. I hate it. I'm excited for it. And 15 minutes of fun. It's going to be a good time. That brings us to the main event of UFC Vegas 23, a high-stakes middleweight attraction between Marvin Vittori and... And Kevin Holland, who steps up on quick turnaround and short notice. Vittori, the angriest Italian in MMA, is 27 years old. He is 16, 4, and 1 overall. He is 6, 2, and 1 in the UFC. Holland, the Sherdog Breakthrough Fighter of the Year for 2020, is 28 years old, 21 and 6 overall. Eight and three since joining the UFC after his appearance on Dana White's Contender Series Season 2, but not signed from that episode. That's a story probably well known to most listeners here, so I won't bother digging in. Whether because of Holland's flat performance against Derek Brunson just a few weeks ago, or because of the short notice, or just because they believe in Vittori that much, Vittori is a substantial favorite here. He is minus 300 to minus 310. Holland is plus 250 or plus 255 as the underdog. Uh, I'm going to ask you for your pick on this one, Jay. But first, just kind of a, a setup question here. Uh, Holland steps in for Darren Till, who pulled out with a broken collarbone uh, a week or two ago. If you're Marvin Vittori, are you happy or sad about the change in opponents and and why? Like, what stands out to you if you're Marvin Vittori about the, about this changeup? Yes, 
I mean, honest and truly, Marvin Vittori has a reason to be happy because Kevin Holland is still a, a even if he isn't as high of a ranked opponent, uh, he is a, you know, an, an often discussed fighter. And that that sometimes matters more if you're in the spotlight. Ooh, you beat Kevin Holland. That guy's pretty hot. That guy, you know, that guy Hansel is so hot right now. We can beat him and, and move up the ranks. Because uh, Kevin Holland's the top 10. Obviously, Darren Till would have been a top five win. And fighters just... Top five wins are what fighters and plants crave. Like, seriously, everybody since the ranking system came out want to have that top five win so they can then put it on their resume. They can stamp it on their CV and go, I beat a top five guy in my division. So Marvin Tory must be heartbroken that he can't fight Darren Till because he gets that. But he still gets a top ten opponent in Kevin Holland, and there's a lot of favorable aspects to this fight. And, 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 and for fans that are, are watching this fight, rolling their eyes going, oh, I know what's going to happen. We just saw it with Derek Brunson. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that Derek Brunson is a substantially better uh, takedown wrestler, grappling artist uh, than Marvin Vittori. Marvin Vittori has a submission threat that Derek Brunson does not present. But in terms of raw takedowns, in terms of Mike Goldberg saying embrace the grind, you can't do much better in the division uh, than Derek Brunson who can stall you out, who can keep you down, who can sit in half guard and just run the time out as he's working the body and working the head, as we saw for the good part of 25 minutes. That's not Marvin Vittori's game. He's not a lay and pray. Sorry, Derek, but it was lay and pray for a while. It's not a lay and pray guy. He doesn't usually keep his opponent grounded if he actually manages to get a takedown. He can't keep him down for long. I believe, I don't have the stopwatch or anything, but I believe... Vittori was on top longer because he knocked down Jack Hermanson than when he actually landed takedowns later in the fight. So he's the kind of guy who will be able to to pull out um, a, a, a submission if it presents itself, and he's going to try to go for it. But it's more of a, an in-your-face kind of, kind of fighter. He's a almost an old-school mentality in that he's a hard-nosed, he's got a granite chin, he can he can strike with the best of him, and he can also threaten and push you in the clinch and and, and muscle you around because he's a big, strong uh, middleweight, and he will have a definitive strength advantage. Although there's obviously the caveat, I, I I just I see if you you could see my hands here, you'd see I'm having Derek Brunson a little higher up than Marvin Vittori when it comes to a few of these categories, like control cage control like being able to 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 keep you against the fence or keep you trapped or have a body lock set up just the kind of tactics that can wear out and tire out kevin holland marvin vittori isn't that kind of specialist he's not that kind of grappler and that is a different kind of element that we're going to see because it's been three it's by fight time it will have been three weeks since kevin holland has competed he has not shored up his takedown defense. He has not figured out how, you know, to get up in a tough situation and scramble in a way that there is very little change. And kind of like when we were talking about how Hamzat Shamaya was coming from fight to fight, well, he's not improving much. He's just here at this level going along the way. Kevin Holland is going to be just about the same Kevin Holland, but he'll also be at an upside because he didn't allow himself to blow up uh, too much between between his last fight and this fight, so it won't be any sort of a tough weight cut. And this is a guy who came in at 183 when he fought Derek Brunson, so that is a big difference uh, in terms of Holland, is that he won't have the fatigue and the exhaustion of not only did I just fight, oh my god, two hard weight cuts in less than a month. No, no, I, I don't think that's the kind of Kevin Holland we're going to see. I think the kind of the Kevin Holland we're going to see is the one that is going to pray with all that is for all that is holy, that Marvin Vittori, the Italian dream, bears down on him and just tries to throw bombs, throws looping shots, because uh, we we found this before throughout. It's, you know, UFC history is littered with examples of of grapplers that fell in love with a big power shot once they landed it. They went, "Oh my God!" Like Roy Nelson is famous for saying. Oh, jujitsu is tough, man. I'm knocking guys out's way better. I love that way more. Whatever the you know the paraphrase. And this is a guy, Marvin Vittori, who got his first UFC knockdown when he dropped Jack Hermanson. That could be the kind of catalyst moment for Vittori to fall in love with his hands 
uh, because he had so much success. And I think that's the worst thing he can do against an accurate counter striker in, in Kevin Holland, because even though his, his Kevin Holland's uh, significant strike accuracy rate fell because of the Derek Brunson fight, he's still among the top 10 most accurate strikers in UFC history. Period at the end, not a huge sample size, but when he, when he throws, he's going to land. He had Derek Brunson in a good amount of danger a few times, and he got careless, and he overextended himself, and he threw a little too hard. Uh, we, we talked about this on our own show, and it was talked about, I believe, on the Short Dog uh, recap show. But Holland kept on overextend, reaching a little too far with his strikes to try and do a little more damage, uh, which then allowed Derek Brunson to get a hold of him. I don't think that is going to happen the same way. I don't believe that's going to present itself. And there's an X factor here. And this is one that I'm probably going to steal from you, so you're welcome. Derek Brunson was more mature and more composed in his, in his fight than he has been in a long time. He did not ever let Kevin Holland's little ch -ch chatter, chatter, chatter get to him. In any degree, it didn't bother him. Derek Brunson four years ago would have gotten upset about it. Now, we all know Marvin Vittori to be a very even-keeled gentleman. He, 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 he thinks before he speaks. Um, he, he makes sure to, to, that he has his head right going into this thing. Okay, this is a guy that's going to get extremely ticked off at Kevin Holland's banter. This is a guy who's going to get upset about it. This is a guy who's going to throw crazy power shots. If you remember when Marvin Vittori fought Carl Roberson, there was a lot of wildness very early on there was a lot before, of wildness before they fought there was a lot of wildness across the board okay so if he comes in the, the game plan the game see the game plan know the game plan hit the takedown stifle out holland get him frustrated and then let him lose some strike you know some some power on his shots the, the game plan but once holland gets in his head just chip 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 come on what are you gonna do hit me if you're not gonna hit me you got nothing that will get to Vittori and make him throw away his game plan. So I am going with my upset special this week um, because not only do I feel that Kevin Holland is a... The, the line's off on this one. Like, I have no illusions that, Mar that Vittori should be the favorite. That he's the rightful favorite. His body of work is impressive. And the holes in Holland's game can be exposed to a degree by Vittori. But at a three-and-a-half-to-one favorite... I don't see that. I don't I don't see Holland as the kind of fighter who will suffer from the short notice opportunity by having fought recently or by taking the fight on a you know two weeks. I think this that this is no big deal. This is a guy who wants to fight all the time, is in the shape to do so, and can go five rounds if he needs to. So my upset special is Kevin Holland. I I can't I, I, I'm, I'm going to probably, this is going to be a tough main card. I'm running the Sherdog.com play-by-play. And as you've noticed, um, I believe I've called for most of these fights to go the distance that we've been talking about. So I believe uh, Kevin Holland will do enough, probably win, probably win three rounds, uh, keep Vittori honest, keep him frustrated, keep him, you know, raging like a bull, charging in wildly and recklessly and being able to counter him and circle away and break from the clinch. Um, give me Kevin Holland by decision, and I will break the hearts of my dear friend Tudor and all the Italians everywhere in snapping this, I believe, historic win streak for Marvin Vittori, which is four fights, and uh, Kevin Holland by shocker. It's two for two, baby. This is my upset special of the night as well for uh, no way. Many, of the same, many of the same reasons you mentioned. In looking at this, I, I think the line is probably skewed like it is, again, just because Vittori has looked great recently, and Jack Hermanson is a better win than anything Holland has on his resume. And then, you know, again, Holland's loss to Brunson was so deflating, and then there's just that added baggage of the optics of it weren't good because he was goofing off while losing the fight. I don't think either of those things come into play here. As you pointed out, Vittori is... Uh, he's a grindy fighter. Uh, he's a fighter who fights and wins by attrition, but not in the sense of taking you down and grinding you out. He is a pressure striker who makes fighters exhausted by making them fight off their back foot and constantly react, react, react. I'm trying to 
remember the last fighter with that general like come forward pressure uh you know pressure striking style that fought Holland. I almost have to go all the way back to his UFC debut against Tiago Santos. And while Santos did beat him, it was a weird fight. It was on short notice. And I mean, Santos won the fight by shooting takedowns. Holland like pulled guard in the first half of, of the round. The I think just because he was so being weird. a goof and, and wanted to like throw Santos off. It worked, but he lost the fight. But in terms of just marching forward and making Kevin Holland react, and either having him lose rounds that way or just not be able to keep up and start tagging him. Nobody's done it. And I am, I'm loath to pick Vittori to be the first. I don't want to bring psychology too much into it, but certainly Holland jaws at people for a reason. And if there is anybody that it's going to work on, it would be, you know, a notoriously hot headed fighter. I mean, this, this is a guy who's in Vittori who, he landed the two biggest wins of his career within the last year, but still his main highlight is trashing a hotel lobby. Uh, I, I'm with you. And this is Vittori in, yes, he's been in a five-round fight before, but against Hermanson, it was a five-round fight against another you know, big guy like himself who cuts a decent amount of weight, and Vittori was dictating the pace. It's easier to have your gas tank in the fifth round. If you've been the one setting the pace for the first four, I don't think that will necessarily be the case against Holland. And therefore I think Holland is going to kind of win this one going away. I'm not going to pick him to finish, although certainly he could, you know, grab a nifty guillotine or something on an exhausted Vittori late, but give me Holland by decision in which I don't know if he wins all five rounds, but I bet he, I bet he wins the last three. That is the Sherdog sure Radio Preview for UFC on ABC2, also known as UFC Vegas 23. For the absent Keith Schillen and the man on the spot, Jay Petri, I am Ben Duffy, Sherdog sure Senior Editor. Be sure to uh, check us out immediately after Saturday's main event through the Sherdog sure front page or on the Sherdog sure YouTube page for the instant live recap and reaction uh, starring Keith and featuring myself. We will take your questions. We'll take your comments. Or are you going to join us, Jay? It's going to be an early day. Oh, this is something very important. I'm interrupting your flow. It's going to happen. This is a very important programming note. The UFC on ABC2 card begins on Big ESPN at noon on Saturday. Noon o'clock. So, and the main card is at 3 o'clock. So we'll be done by about 5, 5.30. And therefore, Jay, who is normally exhausted by 1.30 in the morning when these things end, is going to join us. We will take yeah. your questions and comments through the live chat. Uh, certainly, if our picks turn out to be hilariously wrong, we will be here for your abuse. But between now and then, hope you enjoyed this program and enjoy the fights. Thank you for listening.